the outline for that dual space thing was you had to use the you had to get two inequalities to establish the norm equality. You had to establish the norm yeah, yeah. of the, the of the linear functional by using this representation. One way was harder than the other way. I thought I remember too. It seemed like it. Or I just and two ten number six was supposed to be the warm up problem. Yeah, yeah, I kind of. Where you did it in finite dimensions, and people didn't quite. So it was exactly the same thing. In other words, uh, the dual space depends on the norm of the space, not just on the vector space. So I think somebody said, well, the dual space of Rn is Rn, okay? But that's for the Euclidean norm, okay? But if we put a different norm on n tuples of numbers, then we get a different dual space. Well, <laughs> anyway, have a look at the solution, and um, yeah, I had to go through and figure out exactly how it's done in order to try to present it, so <laughs> that's a little bit different. So let me hand your homeworks back. Um, so I'd say that was the only real difficulties people were having was either s some people got a got uh, the infinite dimensional one and didn't get the finite dimensional one, and um, some people got the finite dimensional one and didn't get the infinite dimensional one. But, uh, okay. So where we are kind of is we did the um, projection theorem, and I wanted. Uh, get the consequences of that projection theorem. Talk a little bit about Fourier series today. I like Fourier series. Fourier series are cool. Have you had PDs? Yeah, and I have Fourier analysis, and that's what I'm doing my thesis on. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah, well, then you should be the local expert. Well, probably not. But, <laughs> but we can add, I've got a great book you can do the problems in if you want. <laughs> It's from 1962, but uh, it's a great little book, yeah. Um, let's see, it's, um, let's see, what is the name of it? Um, it's about Bonnach spaces, but um, about analytic functions of Bonnach spaces. I can't remember the title anyway, but Hoffman. Kenneth Hoffman, who was from MIT back in the old days. It's like he's, um, anyway, um, this guy, in the first chapter called the prelimin preliminaries, he basically covers up to the end of chapter three here. He just says, I'm done, you know, <laughs> with that. And then in chapter two, he does a little thing on Fourier series, and what he has, all the good properties of Fourier, he goes through the, uh, the, um, Fayer kernel, Shizaro sums, and then he doesn't even do the Dirichlet kernel. Uh -huh. And he just puts that in the exercises. Okay. So, <laughs> so that you can do it yourself, yeah. Yeah, kind of. It's a pretty nice set of exercises. So he makes it's a pretty... a nice book I should pick up? And maybe mm, it's a nice book. That's definitely a nice book. Uh, it's a classic, you know. I mean, it's already well, 50 years old, so more than 50 years right, old. You might be able to. I'll look it up. It's a nice thin book. It's got a lot of stuff. It's about, if you like algebra, it's, it's got a lot of algebra in it. But the first two chapters might be kind of succinct. And I mean, you know, uh, it references Sigmund and all that. Um, anyway, it's nice to look at anyway. You might want to look at it. Yeah, after doing 2, 6, and 2, 8 in that last problem, and I thought, could that be true? <laughs> no, I mean, it was just like a few lines long, and I thought, no. I think it's called Bonnach Spaces of Analytic Functions or something Bonnach like that. Bonnach Spaces of Analytic Functions? Yeah, I think that's what it's called. But anyway, you won't have too much trouble finding Kenneth Hoffman. This might be useful for me. 1962. It's an oldie. Okay. So let's go back and... Um, Talk a little bit about orthonormal sequences and sets. Okay. 
here's some notes and some homework solutions and some homework problems. Okay. So are there any questions about your homework that's due this week? Anybody have any questions about 3334 right now? 3.3 and 3.4? Somebody said it's a little bit harder. <laughs> okay. Okay. I see. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, maybe the orthonormalization I'm going to do will help you a little bit. Oh, I got that. You got that problem before. <laughs> okay. Okay. I noticed that people were able to use the continuity of the inner product. I didn't actually go over that lemma. But except that I guess I did it in essence a while back when I was talking about the norm, the... Uh, Supposed to use that? No, you were supposed to use it. Oh, okay. Continuity of the inner product. I just hadn't gone over it. I just noticed that I hadn't put it in the notes. But people were able to use it, so I'm not going to go through that again. Um, at least, does it, no questions at all in the homework at all this week? Is it going to be doable? If you don't have any questions. <laughs> okay. I forgot to bring my book down here today. Okay, I might need to. Look at it. Um, Matt just said it was harder, so I thought I'll know. <laughs> Have you guys looked at it? I have a test. Yeah, I have a test and I'll be good one. Okay. So. All right. So everybody's just going to swing it. Okay, well, let's do a little orthonormalization. I guess I better talk a little bit about. Um, about um, what were the ones that are giving you trouble, at least? Anyone? One. Three, three, number six. Show that something's closed, and then sh find the uh, the uh, orthogonal complement. Uh, no, three, three, number one, actually. Three, three, number one. Yeah. And I had an answer in the back of the book. Wasn't helpful. <clears throat> uh, okay. <laughs> okay, here's an. Okay, here's what's going on. So basically. <clears throat> Three, three, number one. You had let H be a Hilbert space and let you give yourself a convex subset. And Xn is sequence of M such that the norm of Xn goes to D where D is the infimum. Show that Xn converges in H. It doesn't mean that Xn converges in M. It means it converges in H. In other words, M might be the open ball. Sure. M might be the open ball, even in Rn. That would be the case, right? So if you took M to be the open unit ball, we'll just go for the counterexample. M is open unit ball in R2. And I have um, uh, X here. I'm sorry, you want to, let's see now, the ball, um, I'm sorry. So actually, what you're doing is that you're taking the origin over here. I'm going to take this to be the open ball um, norm of x minus 2 less than 1. 2, 0. Norm of x minus 2, 0. Less than 1. I'm going to take the open ball here. This is my convex set m. Because I want to take xn so that uh, d is infimum. In other words, I'm taking the distance from the origin to the set. All right, D is going to be the infimum of norm X minus 0. So 0 is the point outside M, X in M. That's the setup. Okay. And so now what you're going to do is you're going to take Xn in M. Right, Xn is trying to approach the closest point in M to the origin. Okay, you want to show the sequence Xn converges in H 
in age. So probably want to show it's Cauchy. Yeah. Yeah, you just show it's Cauchy. So it's exactly this parallelogram equality thing. They're asking you to go through the whole thing again. That's all. Right. So you just have to go through the parallelogram equality because you're in a Hilbert space. <coughs> so all you have to do is go through the parallelogram equality again. But this time, you don't have the... the so you're supposed to go that part through the part of the proof of 3.3-1. Parallelogram equality argument of 3.3-1 to show xn is Cauchy. That's all you have to do. Okay. That's what you're supposed to do. So what they're doing is they're taking a case where M is not complete because M need not be closed. That's all they're doing. They're saying, okay, suppose now M is just a subset, a convex subset. You're still going to use the convexity. But in that parallelogram equality argument, you did not use that M was closed, okay, or complete in its own right. Okay? You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. You only use that it was complete when you actually went to the limit sure. of YN. Okay. So that's exactly the, the, the problem. So they're just asking you to retrace the argument, make sure you can do it. Does that make sense with the hint? Did the hint is that consistent with the hint in the book? Yeah, yeah, I got that part. Okay. Yeah, that parallelogram equality business. I thought you all kind of grokked that last time, but I'm not sure. Maybe you didn't. So, oh, that's nice. I think you understood, appreciated that <laughs> that it doesn't hold if you weren't in an inner product space. I think I got that point home. Yeah, yeah, we had a, a problem it's last a, time. Yeah. Okay, so now you have to just make sure you've got the inner product case salted away. All right. All right. That should only take a couple hours. <laughs> okay. Well, for those people who haven't seen the Gram-Schmidt process in a while, let's go through that a little bit. Okay. So what's an orthonormal sequence in set? Let's start this over again. I'm having to slow down a little bit because I don't want to get ahead too far ahead of you all. I'm having trouble keeping up. Um, so, an orthonormal set M in an inner product space X um, satisfies Um, x, y, the inner product is equal to zero for all x and y in M, okay, with x under equal to y, and also that the norm of each of those elements is equal to one. Okay, so we think of an orthonormal sequence usually, but the Hilbert space can have, can be, you know, bigger than that. It can have an uncountable number of orthonormal elements. And I haven't introduced those yet, but those examples yet, but let's just keep that in the back of our mind. That's why the notation is the way it is in the book. Okay. 
we're going to focus on the more ordinary case of orthonormal sequences where the most of the applications arise. Okay. So if, if M is countable, then we arrange it as a sequence. E1, E2, E3, and so on. Okay. Now, there's a statement in the book, in this very beginning of this section on orthonormal sequences and sets, that every Hilbert space has one. Okay. And so one of the exercises is in the separable Hilbert space case, you can actually use ordinary induction to construct one by the Gram-Schmidt process. And um, if the Hilbert space isn't separable, then you can use Zorn's lemma, which we're going to talk about next chapter. Okay, so these things exist. Uh, let's see. I'm sorry, that's the total case. Of course, they always exist. You can always get small sets. The question is, can you get one as big as possible? All right, so there's the question of getting a, a big orthonormal set, the biggest one you can get in essence. And that's the, case, that's the question of totality. He calls it totality. Old authors call it completeness problem. So if you look up the uh, Bonnick Spaces of Analytic Functions book I was mentioning, uh, then he'll talk about the completeness of the trigonometric system rather than the totality. I think this author also mentions those, those words. Okay. So. So automatically any uh, orthonormal set is linearly independent. You had that practically as a, as a homework exercise this time, didn't you? Didn't you have that as the homework exercise? Three, uh, I think you did have that as a homework exercise, that if you have the linear independence of the orthonormal set. Okay, well, then of course that would give you of the orthonormal set. Automatically any uh, linear, any orthonormal set is linearly independent. That means if you take a finite linear combination of elements from the set that's equal to zero as a vector, then all the coefficients must be zero. It's always defined in terms of finite linear combinations, so there's no infinite linear combinations in that definition. Okay. If a linearly independent sequence is given, also, if a linearly independent sequence, I'm just going to talk about sequences here, sequence is given, it may be converted converted to an orthonormal sequence E1, E2, and so on, with the property that, I'm sorry, if, 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 an, if a linearly independent sequence, I give it that a name, X1, X2, X3, etc., is given, it may be converted to orthonormal sequence E1, E2, and so on, with the property that the, the span of the first n elements of the linearly independent sequence that was given is equal to the span of the first n elements of the orthonormal sequence for all n. Okay. And that's the Gram-Schmidt process. This goes, okay, this uh, Gram-Schmidt process gives this conversion.
Okay, as follows, let's just have an example. And so then I think I'll work with, since we're not going to work with the Hermit system much except in one extra credit exercise, uh, I'm going to work with the, um, the Hermit system. Okay, so consider the real space L2 minus infinity to infinity with inner product x, y, so no complex numbers in this one, integral minus infinity to infinity, x of t, y of t, um, dt. Okay. There's also, way, uh, there's also another way to do this is with a weighted inner product, is to put an e to the minus t squared in there. Okay. That's a different space of functions, but... Um, so, so, in other words, L2 means that, here that means that if I integrate the square of the function from minus infinity to infinity, then the integral converges, okay? So this is integral, sort of all x, such that integral x of t squared dt is finite. And actually, this is, these are supposed to be the Lebesgue square integrable functions, okay? We're just <laughs> okay. We're not doing the Lebesgue theory in this course, so you sort of have to say, say, well, I think I know what you're talking about. Okay, <laughs> I can extend I can extend the integral from the Riemann integral to something a little fancier. Okay, and you'll have that course someday. Okay. So in fact, the way the author is doing with this is he basically says, well, he just has this theorem on completion. He has a general construction for completion. It's in chapter one, it's in chapter two, it's in chapter three, okay, for metric spaces, for norm spaces, and for um, inner product spaces. He just repeats the same theorem over and over and over. Basically, say so you can take any space that's not complete already in this metric, okay, and complete it. It's the standard smallest complete space that contains the space. Go ahead. Oh, so he just kind of implies the measure theory. Yeah. Well, yeah, he he, he says this, and he says that if you actually uh, that well, then the theorem is that um, with the Lebesgue integral, that is the completion. Okay. 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 So um, he takes if you if you've done the reading, he takes the continuous functions on the unit interval. Okay, and you can define this inner product just like this, only it does integral zero to one. Okay, that gives you an inner product, a continuous function. That's not a complete space with a norm given by that inner product. C01 with the max norm is a complete Banach space, but with the inner product norm, it's not a complete space. Okay. Right. Um, and so the standard completion which is, there's a, there's a recipe for the completion, uh, turns out to be these Lebesgue square integral functions on the unit interval in that case, right? Here we're taking Lebesgue square integral functions on the full line. Okay. All right, and then the continuous functions, then whatever space you started with is automatically dense in that completion. So, in particular, the uh, Well, we didn't do the, uh, we didn't actually talk about uh, L2 minus infinity to infinity being the completion of something at this point. So I don't think I better go any further with that discussion. <laughs> okay, we talked about L2, 0, 1 being the completion of something. All right, so there's still, you might guess what, the, what this L2 is completing if it does complete something more elementary, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess you could take continuous functions to square integrals finite. That must be the completion of those, right? I mean, if we were going to guess. You can always talk, you talk about continuous functions to square integrals finite, right? Okay. 
Okay. So we take that one, and now let's take the following functions. Let's take x0 equals e to the minus t squared over 2. Let's take x1 equals t e to the minus t squared over 2. And x2 equals t squared e to the minus t squared over 2. Okay, those are literally independent functions okay, that are all in this space. Okay, let's do the Gram-Schmidt process. <laughs> Okay, let's find an orthonormal set of functions, E0, E1, E2, that span, so that the span of E0 is the same as the span of X0, the span of E0, E1 is the same as the span of X0, and X1 and the span of E0, E1, and E2 is the same as the span of X0, X1, and X2. <clears throat> okay. E's, okay, the Gram-Schmidt process. It takes E0, uh, E0 is simply going to be X0 divided by the norm of X0. That's going to give you a unit vector. And of course, that's all E0 will be then. Uh, and so what does that come out to be? That's E to the minus T, the function E to the minus T squared over 2 divided by the norm of that, which is square root integral minus infinity to infinity E to the minus T squared DT. That take e to the minus t squared and multiply it by itself. It gives me an e to the uh, e to the minus t squared over two times e to the minus t squared over two is e to the minus t squared. <clears throat> so what is this integral? You have to look that up in a table of integrals or something. He actually does the integral in the book, I think. Um, it's the square root of pi. So this comes out e to the minus t squared over two over the square root of the square root of pi. Okay, so which is so you get this weird fourth root of pi in here, one over the fourth root of pi, e to the minus t squared over two. That's what e zero is. Okay, and usually because you don't okay. So oftentimes the an orthogonal system is presented to you because they don't want all these weird constants to show up. There's too many constants to memorize and save and so on and because it's trivial to orthonormalize, okay, by dividing by the norm. So or, oftentimes these functions are only given in the orthogonal form. Mm -hmm. okay, if you look in the book, they're not going to give you the orthonormal one. You're not going to see the fourth root of pi. Okay, and the formula is, well, at least, well, not always, or if it is, it's going to be hidden. <clears throat> okay. So what are you going to take now? You're going to take V1 equals X1 minus X1 E0 inner product with, inner product of X1 with E0 times E0. Now that's automatically going to be perpendicular to E0, because E0 was normalized, right? Automatically V1 inner product E0 equals X1 E0 minus X1 E0 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 which is X1 E0 minus X1 E0 times 1 equals 0. Okay. So V1, I'm just recalling why we take V1 this way, why this formula is natural. It involves E0, which is in turn just the normalization of X0, and X1. So this is a linear combination of X0 and X1. So certainly V1 is in the span of X0 and X1, right? but it's also perpendicular to E0, therefore it's linearly independent of X0. So you have something in the span of X0 and X1 which is linearly independent of X0. That means you're just getting that, that E0 and V1 span X0. Span of E0 and X1, which is already the span of X0 and X1, equals the span of E0 and V1, okay? 
and now uh, I'm going to normalize V1. So I have to calculate V1 and then divide by its norm. So I'm going to have E1 is the V1 divided by the norm of V1. That's all it is. So I'm going to, in one calculation, I'm going to go ahead and write all this thing down. Okay. So this is X1, which is T e to the minus t squared over 2 minus 1 over the fourth root of pi integral minus infinity to infinity. The one fourth root of pi comes from this one e0 and then I'm going to get another fourth root of pi from another e0. So I'll just write it all down. x1 is t e to the minus t squared over 2. Then I have another e to the minus t squared over 2 dt and then I have Another, um, then I have time, that's the integral, all right? So that's the inner product. One of the one fourth roots of pi came from E0 here. And now this was the x1, right? This is the x1. This fourth root of pi, I'm just taking outside the integral. Okay, it came with this one. And then I have another one over fourth root of pi. I'm writing everything down, even though it's all going to cancel just so you can see it. Okay, e to the minus t squared over 2. I should probably put it, uh, a substitution variable in here, like a t prime or something like that, so you understand that one, one of the variables t is integrated out, the other one is kept. Right? So you can put a t, t prime here if you want, dt prime, so that you understand that that one is being integrated. And then I have to divide by the norm of this thing. Okay? So hopefully that's going to work out nicely, and it does, because here I have e to the minus t squared against t on the interval minus infinity to infinity, so this integral is zero. In other words, this e zero, uh, x zero and x one were already orthogonal in this inner product. These were orthogonal. And also, these are going to be orthogonal. x1 and x2 are orthogonal. Okay? So already there's a certain amount of orthogonality, but of course, x0 is not orthogonal to x2. Okay? So that's where the work is going to come in. So I have e1 is equal to simply t e to the minus t squared over 2 divided by minus 0 divided by the norm of t e to the minus t squared over 2 minus 0. So what does that mean? I have to do another integral if I want to get the orthonormalization. So that's t e to the minus t squared over 2 is the basic function. And then the constant is the square root of the integral minus infinity to infinity. I have to square that thing. t squared e to the minus t squared dt. Again, you can put the prime on there if you want just so you understand that that's the, integral, the, the variable that's being integrated. Okay? Is that too cumbersome to put the prime on there? A little bit? Okay, well then I won't put it on there. You put a different variable, s if you prefer. Okay, integration variable. I forgot my square sign now that I erased it all. Here's a square sign. Okay? So now I have to do that integral, and now a little integration by parts or something. <clears throat> so, there's another two hours, right? <laughs> plug it into Maple. Please, you know. download Maple and plug it in. That's just as fast. <laughs> you don't typically do that either. It's do you? No, I don't care that much. <laughs> <laughs> however, you know, however it's going to do. I mean, if you can do it faster that way, that's great. You know. Yeah, I mean, I um, how to do that. Right. So it looks like I didn't actually do the whole the work here myself. I just put in a plugged in an answer. Okay, I have to do an integration by parts, and I did it somewhere on uh, a scratch paper. It looks like. So this comes out to be one half the square root of pi. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I guess I could sketch it out on the side here. Uh, 
I need a 2t e to the minus t squared with a minus sign to make that part of it, and then I have a 1 half t left, integral minus infinity to infinity. Okay. And then if I do the integration by parts, the integrated term is going to go out, so then I'm going to get a plus uh, I'm sorry, this is a half here. Oh, that's right. Ah. It's not D that, it's D. I got the wrong thing. It's D this is 2t e to the minus t squared. So that's what it is. So I get that equal to this integral is equal to this, which is equal, therefore, to um, the integrated term is going to go out, all right, 0 plus integral 1 half e to the minus t squared dt minus infinity to infinity equals 1 half the square root of pi. Okay. So, okay, this is a little bit of a boring thing. So you plug this in. So therefore, that uh, e1 is equal to t e to the minus t squared over 2 over the square root of a half square root of pi. Okay, et cetera. Then we'll just write down the next step. V2 is equal to x2 minus x2 e0 inner product e0, excuse me, inner product e0 times e0 minus x2 inner product e1 times e1. Now you have e0 and e1, so you can just plug in from above what this is. So that comes out t squared e to the minus t squared over 2 minus something. x2 with e0 has a non-trivial inner product. Okay? And so x2, e0, I have to go to e0. e0 was here. x2 is here. Okay? So I have a non-trivial inner product here, and then I have a zero inner product. Uh, is that right here? Yeah. So this is going to give minus... 1 over the fourth root of pi integral minus infinity to infinity t squared e to the minus t squared dt times e0, which is 1 over the fourth root of pi e to the minus t squared over 2. And then I'm going to get minus 0. Because I'm going to get a cubic integral against the e to the minus t squared. I'm going to do x2 against e1. So this was just a number, and then I get this. So I'm going to get 2 fourth root of pi, which gives me a square root of pi. Yeah, and then the integral is the 1 half the square root of pi. So I'm going to get a square root of pi here from these two fourth roots. One is, one is from the e, E0 once, and then again from the E0. So I'm just trying to remind you that these constants show up a bunch of times when you follow these formulas. They show up twice, once here and once there, okay? So it takes the square root away, <laughs> the square, one of the square roots away. So I have the square root of pi now, okay? And then this is a one-half square root of pi. So V3, V2, turns out this example terminates quickly because I'm almost done. So this comes out to be T squared E to the minus T squared over 2 minus 1 over the square root of pi times 1 half square root of pi times E to the minus T squared over 2. Okay. And then you have to normalize it. So this comes out to be T squared minus a half then times e to the minus t squared over 2. Then I have to normalize it. So I won't do that. Okay, so e2 is v2 over the norm. Well, I did it in the notes, so I had more time and more scratch paper. So then finally, e2 equals v2 over the norm of v2 equals t squared minus a half e to the minus t squared over 2 over 
the square root. I have to take the square of this thing, which will be t to the fourth minus t squared plus a quarter e to the minus t squared dt. Okay, so now I have to do the t. To the, I have to do the integration by parts a couple times to get to t to the fourth business. Okay. And if you this well, I'll, I'll mention what the, the the integration is that this this thing becomes. Um, a square root of three quarters squared of pi minus a half squared of pi plus a quarter squared of pi. It's got to be not negative, and it does come out to be a half squared of pi again, the whole thing. So, all told, you get that E2 is equal to t squared minus a half. Well, there's a square root of two coming from that. The square root of one half in the denominator. There's a fourth root of pi coming, and then I get t, and then I get my e to, exponential e to the minus t squared over two. And if you actually check this against the formula, it checks with seven a and seven star. In section three seven, I don't know if you can read those. 7a and 7 stars. We want to look up the formulas. Anyway, that's the process. So you shouldn't have any problem doing the uh, Legendre polynomials. It's easier. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So now you have some sense of what an orthonormal sequence is. In other words, if I had taken all of the, uh, you know, monic polynomials 1, t, t squared, t cubed, t to the fourth, and so on, and multiply by e to the minus t squared over 2. They're all in L2, and that gives you, it turns out then if you orthonormalize that sequence of functions, you get a, uh, uh, an orthonormal sequence, okay, that you can't add anything to, all right? In other words, if you try to, if you take all of those, all right, and then you take the, um, and call that set M. And then you take the orthogonal complement of that in L2. You get nothing. Okay, only zero. Only zero is orthogonal to all of them. So there's no more to add. That's the totality. Now, the proof of that uh, requires a little bit of functional analysis. <laughs> And we'll get to that. I want to introduce the Weierstrass approximation theorem, at least, which isn't in this text, I believe, or till later. I think we can do it earlier, though. So he's got to, he has to jump around. In other words, this text is written from the point of view that you didn't have a Lebesgue theory course. So he has to jump around a little bit as well. He does a pretty good job of it. But I think we could give the Weierstrass approximation theorem. There are many proofs of the Weierstrass approximation theorem, and I don't like his proof that much. So, I'm, and there are lots of cute ones. There's even one involving probability, which is the one I'm going to give, because everybody here has said probability. Well, you'll get it probability. <laughs> I'll give you some probability. <laughs> No, I've managed to make it this far with uh, any probability or stats. Of course, that's all. Oh, my God. Not even, like, math 3 or anything. I don't know any. I know. Okay. Well. <laughs> okay. What's, what's Bessel's inequality? Bessel's inequality is a basic thing that we get. Um... <coughs> as follows. So, so we're going to call the, the Fourier cof, uh, if E1, E2, etc. is an orthonormal set in our inner product space, X, we're not doing Hilbert space yet, then um, X, E, K 
is called the case for a coefficient. X. Okay. And the theorem is that just in the inner product space we have here, um, Bessel's inequality is this. That in any inner product space, X inner product space, and so on, inner product space is above. you have that the norm of x squared, okay, which is a finite number, is greater or equal to the sum, k goes from 1 to infinity, of the absolute values of the squares of the Fourier coefficients. Okay, that's the basic thing. Okay. So I think if I, if I took that over here, I was getting E0, E1, and so on. And then I take any function in L2, and I take the inner product with one of these things like this. Here's E, here's E2, okay? And then there'd be E3 and so on and so forth. Oh, I'm sorry, here's E2. Okay. Take the inner product, take the square, okay? add up and I get a finite number. Okay. Now how does that follow? What's the proof? Okay. So here's the way we're going to do it. We can use the projections theorem. Let y n equal the span of, of E1 through E n. That's a finite dimensional vector space norm space because it's got the inner product, right? And therefore it's complete. Y n is convex and complete. So I can apply the, the um, theorem 3.3-1, okay? By 3.3-1, there exists a unique y in this space such that our given x so it's the, the distance between x and y is the minimum overall y tilde in this capital Y sub n of the distances between x and y tilde. Okay, that was the notation we used. We were trying to find the distance from x to y n. I guess we call that delta. Delta equal distance from x to the, to the convex set, which in this case is the whole subspace. Moreover, uh, by orthogonality lemma. What was the orthogonality lemma? Would you look that up, 3.3-2, so everybody will, by, by orthogonality lemma. I think everybody remembers to this, this distance problem is this far. <laughs> anyway, you're gonna remember real well when you do exercise 3.3.1, because you have to go through that parallelogram equality again, which is exactly how we proved that it was this, there was this unique y. But orthogonality lemma 3.3 dash 2, what does that say now? Want me to read it? Yes, please, just read it real loud. In theorem 3.3 dash 1, let m be a complete subspace y and x in capital X fixed. Yeah. And d equals x minus y is orthogonal to capital Y. Right. Yeah. So that we have z equals x minus y is perpendicular, is orthogonal. to this capital Y, all right? So we do have it. 
I'm calling it Y sub n because it's only it's n dimensional. The span of E1 through En. That's what gave us the completeness from chapter two, right? The, the finite dimensional norm space is going to be complete. Now, so that's orthogonal. Now, we claim that, in fact, Y is simply given by the Fourier coefficients in the linear combination, E1 through EN. Claim Y equals Y1, which I'm going to define to be summation K goes from 1 to N X EK times EK. So I'm going to take this expansion. So I'm going to call Y1 this thing. I'm going to claim that Y is equal to Y1. All right, is, that, is that clear enough? So you find y1 and I claim y equals y1. <laughs> okay, maybe I just maybe I'll make that write that easy better. So define y1 this way and then claim y equals y1. Okay? Now how would you do that? We'll use the unicity of the direct sum decomposition. Okay? Okay, I claim that um, to prove it, proof of claim, um, show so this this is in capital Y at least, right? So at least there's a chance for the claim. I'll point that out, right? Now, proof of claim, how am I going to do it? I want to use the unicity of the direct sum decomposition. Uh, I claim, show that y1, okay, all that, that z1 equals x minus y1, okay, um, in fact, belongs to y, the, the orthogonal complement of yn. Okay, if I can do that, then I have uh, x, y1 plus z1 equals x in the direct sum decomposition. But I said that's unique. Okay. Um, representation. Okay. Check this. Check. Check this statement. All right. Let's see. Z1. Z1 equals X minus summation X E K times E K. K goes from 1 to N. And now I'm going to uh, is inter, inter product with e k. All right, is equal to zero. Uh, is perpendicular to e k for every k. That's easy to see by the inner product, because e k itself is orthonormal. All I have to do is because Let's see, if I take Z1, inner product EK, I get X inner product EK minus summation X inner product, well, I should put a, dumb, uh, a substitution index here, J. J goes from 1 to N. J here, so that I can put this EK here. X inner product EJ, EJ inner product EK, J goes from 1 to N. EJ in product EK is delta JK. So I get um, XEK minus XEK. Equals 0. All right. 
So. Z1 equals X minus Y1, in fact, belongs to the orthogonal complement of Yn. But we know that the direct, de direct sum decomposition in this context is unique by 3.3-4. Now, if you're careful, you read 3.3-4, it says that in that hy the hypothesis is that X is a Hilbert space and that y is a closed subspace of Hilbert space, but the, the variant of the same theorem is that if x is an inner product space and y is a complete subspace, then the same proof goes through. Okay. You see, because closed in a, in a Hilbert space was complete. So he stated it for the Hilbert space case, because I guess it's more standard, but there's two variations of the statement of 3.3-4, either closed subspace of Hilbert space or complete subspace of an inner product space. <laughs> you still get the unicity in the direct sum decomposition. So I have that x equals y1 plus z1, but also I have, uh, but also x equals y plus z for z equals x minus y. That was also uh, a direct sum decomposition, all right? Because I already said z was orthogonal to yn, and right? that was the orthogonality lemma. Direct, two direct de sum decompositions. Thus, by proof of theorem 334, Um, y equals y1 and z equals z1. Okay. What I said is that I've got, if the, I have, what is the proof? If I've got, what is the proof? I say I've got these two direct sum decompositions which I've already established, already established by the orthogonality lemma that, z, that x equals y plus z, whereas z was in y and so, so that means that z is in y and perp. So I've got y in yn and z in yn, ortho, in the orthogonal complement of yn. I've also got y1 in yn and z1 in the orthogonal complement of yn. So this means z1 is in yn perp, okay? So I've got this. And I've got x equals y1 plus z1 because z was equal to x minus y1. Okay. And I've also got x equals y plus z. All right. So I've got this, you know, that's the, then the proof in theorem 3.3-4 was saying, well, there's only one way to do that. Why? Because if I take the difference of those two, I get that... Um, y1 minus y equals z minus z1. By putting the two sides, you get the difference is equal to zero. So put two sides, y1 minus y equals z minus z1. Okay. This is in y. This is in the orthogonal complement of y. But we said the intersection of those two is always zero. Okay. So that means y minus y1 equals zero, z minus z1 equals zero. Okay. The only thing that can be in both y and its orthogonal complement is a zero vector because the inner product of any such vector with itself has to be zero. Inner product of a vector with itself equal to zero is z, right? So in other words, if w equals y minus y1 equals z1 minus z, okay, w is in y and the orthogonal complement of y, then of course, inner product of w with itself is zero because it's in both spaces. Okay, so W is zero. So that's the reproof of the uni unicity in the direct sum decomposition. So therefore, we've established that Y is just this Fourier series. That's what we call the Fourier series. It's just a projection, orthogonal projection onto Yn. It's given like that. That's all we've done here, <laughs> okay? All right? We could have probably done it more quickly directly, okay, rather than going through 3.3-1. That's the way it was set up because he wanted a more general theorem about convexity and so on and so forth. Okay? 
So you have that. Bessel's, well, so then, so you have this one, and now what is, how does Bessel's inequality come out? So now, just pull out the Pythagorean theorem, I believe. <laughs> okay, so x, so x now is equal to y, is equal to uh, summation, is equal to y plus z, okay, where y1 plus z1, okay, I'll just write it, that's the one I want. Okay, so the norm of x squared is equal to the norm of y1 squared plus the norm of z1 squared by orthogonality. This Pythagorean relationship, right? Because it's, well, how do you get that? It's x, it's y1 plus z1. I don't think we did our Pythagorean theorem yet, but here it is. You practically did it in your homework, I thought. Didn't you do it in your homework for this week? Yeah, so this is coming out to be y1 inner product y1 plus z1 inner product y1 plus y1 inner product z1 plus z1 inner product z1 where in general if it's a complex inner product space I have to worry about the order but since these two middle terms are zero no matter whether it's complex or real okay zero is <laughs> zero okay so I get y1 squared plus 0 plus z1 squared. But what is the square of the norm of y1 squared? It's easy to calculate. It's just the sum of the squares of the Fourier coefficients. Right? Because this is just a good old orthogonal sum. Uh, when I take the inner product of itself, the only terms are going to come are the diagonal ones. So this is equal to summation x e k absolute squared, the absolute value does come in, okay, if you're careful. Um, um, and with the complex case, right, because I'm going to take, um, maybe I'll just do a sum of two, make sure that it works out, okay, <laughs> for you all. Okay, so if I took x e1 e one plus x e two e two and then I took the inner product of that with itself a lot of writing. Okay. Then I would get um yeah, x e one See, if I take this, these are the scalars, right? So the second scalar on the other side comes out with a conjugate sign. E1, E1, all right, plus 0, plus 0, plus X, E2, X, E2, conjugate sign, E2, E2. Okay. Just make sure we didn't miss any tricks here. Okay. <laughs> There's all these inner product signs and so on, but that's just the representation of a scalar. Scalar, E1, inner product, scalar, E1. Right? When I pull this scalar out, it doesn't get changed. But when I pull this scalar out of the right side of the inner product, I get a conjugate sign. So this comes out to be X, E1, absolute squared plus X, E2 absolute square. Okay? So we get the sum of the squares of the absolute values k goes from 1 to n plus something left over which is not negative. I don't know how big it is. Okay? It might be zero. If x was in the subspace already, that's just zero. And I have a representation of x as the Fourier sum. Alright? I mean, one, so one case is that, so here's this y n equals the span of e1 through e n then one case is, of course, is that x is already in that space. And then I've already got, I've written x as, uh, in terms of the basis, which is trivial, that fact. So I knew what the answer should be, okay? This is trivial, the x would be written this way. Um, because it's got to be some linear combination, alpha k 
e k. And then you can, but then inner product with x and uh, and you'll. Uh, You'll figure out that the four. I'm not going to go through that. You'll figure out that the x, the inner product of x with e k is the right, is the alpha k. Right? Is that right? So in other words, if x is in y n, let's check this. If x is in y n, so x is equal to summation alpha k e k. Can you all do that? And check that 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 the alpha k, then alpha k is equal to x e k directly. That's easy because let's put it alpha j e j as I did before. That's the only trick here. Okay. <laughs> and then inner product with alpha with e k, then x e k. Um, by inner producting with ek on the left side is equal to summation j goes from 1 to n alpha j ej ek and that's just the delta again so you get that alpha k is equal to x with ek all right so that's, so the infinite series is called the fourier series and what we know now is that that infinite series converges in L2. I have to do the, there's a little bit of proof. Okay, that's the content of of uh, 3.5-2. And for the context there, we we're going to talk a little bit about real Fourier series. Okay, trigonometric sums. All right, so I'll start there next time. But 3.5-2 tells me. Now that I have this Bessel's inequality, 3.5-2 tells me that this, that um, the series um, summation alpha k e k, if e k is orthonormal, orthonormal sequence, if e1, e2, and so on, orthonormal sequence, sequence um, in a Hilbert space now. So now I'm going to go to a Hilbert space. So I'm going to make sure that my space is complete. So the Cauchy sequences will converge. Then let's call this double star. This series, k goes from 1 to infinity, converges in H, if and only if summation of these squares of the coefficients, k goes from 1 to infinity, converges. Okay. And further, then A, this is part A, and B further, if um, we write x equals the sum k goes from 1 to infinity alpha k e k in this case further if in this case case in this case if, if really do you do have this condition one of these two conditions okay in this case we write if in this case we write x is the sum, all right? So it's some limit of partial sums, right? Converging in A. So x is something in my Hilbert space. Then alpha k equals x with e k. That's exactly the same proof, except for the fact that I'm going to use the continuity of the inner product, exactly like you did in the homework. I have the partial sum is going to x. The partial sum Okay, inner product e k will give you alpha k equals x x n e k, right? And then take 
um, n to infinity, you get x ek, right? Okay, we'll go through that again next time. Then there's a one sta last statement of this theorem 35-2. Finally, you can um, finally see, and this is the point, if y in H is given, then the series summation k goes from 1 to infinity, y ek ek converges all right to something to x all right but x not need equal to y all right okay that's because uh, even though you've got an orthonormal sequence it may not be complete or total, as it's so called. In other words, suppose I, if I just, if I even if I just had a, um, if I was in Rn, suppose I just took, you know, if I was in R20, okay, Euclidean space with 20 dimensions, I only took 10 orthonormal vectors, okay. All this would be holding with infinity replaced by 10, but since I don't have a, a full basis of R20, I, I'm not going to get my original vector y back again by doing the this construction, all right? You understand what I'm saying? Something very trivial. If I'm in R20, all right, 20 dimensions, and I take uh, an orthogonal or orthonormal basis consisting of 10 vectors, to say 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, and so up to the 10th one, all right? The 10th standard basis vector, okay? That's an, orthog that's an orthonormal sequence. It's not a basis, right? It's not a basis of R20. But see, there's no assumption here that they actually had a basis of a full Hilbert space, okay, in this, yeah. in this statement. In fact, what would it be? What would it be? In other words, I have an orthonormal sequence that's infinite. Well, let's say, or even in the trig systems, if I just left, if I had the cosines and the sines, but I left the cosines out, <laughs> okay, okay, then I'm not going to be able to get any even function, right? So, you can't, so that's the idea, I mean, that's why I'm not getting necessarily y back again in this part of, this, this part of the theorem. Something kind of, this is just a trivial answer, trivial answer for that, okay? So, then this brings up the whole question of do I have a total orthonormal sequence or not. Total orthonormal sequence will mean that if it's total, then I'm going to get equality here. Okay. And then the Fourier series is going to converge in L2 to the original X. So the Fourier series of X is going to converge to X. Once I have equal in the, in the Bessel's inequality, which is then called the Parseval's equality. Okay, or Parseval's identity. All right, so there's a condition. I have to make sure I'm getting that the orthogonal complement of the uh, space spanned by this is the zero. Okay? I have to make sure there's nothing that's orthogonal to all of these. If there is, I have to add it in still, okay? To continue making my basis. Okay. So then the, the theorem would be something like the trig system is, comp is total. If you take the cosines and sines, and the constant function on the interval 0 to 2 pi, that is going to be a total orthonormal set for L2 of the unit interval. Okay, so read up that a little bit. Um, so we're just barely getting into 3.5 here, it looks like. We have, well, Bessel's inequality actually followed from 3.4, and 3.5 is about orthonormal sets. Okay, but I'm just going to finish up 3.6 and 3.7 next time anyway, I guess. <laughs> There's not that much to say more about it. Okay, so please bring your questions. If It looks like people are getting a little bit behind on the homework. Um, so what do you think, what kind of adjustment do we need?